Azure Service Bus is a fully managed enterprise message broker with message queuing and publish subscribe topics. Service Bus is used to decouple applications and services from each other and supports reliable message queuing and publish subscribe messaging capabilities. Some of the core messaging capabilities supported include queues, topics and subscriptions, and rules and actions. In this video, we will learn how to get started with queues in Azure Service Bus and use it from a .NET application. We will see how to create a queue, send messages to the queue, different properties that you can set when sending messages, and also using these messages in processing. For that, we will use an Azure function to trigger based on queue messages that's arriving on the Azure Service Bus. We will also learn how to use dependency injection and managed identity when connecting to queues. This will allow us to connect to a service bus without any sensitive keys or application secrets in our configuration files. Hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. If you're new here, my name is Rahul. I'm an Azure MVP and also an AWS community builder. I make videos around .NET, Azure, ASP.NET Core, DevOps, and AWS. Without much delay, let's get started with Azure Service Bus queues. Here, I have a default ASP.NET Web API application template on .NET 6 set up and running on my Visual Studio 2022. If you look here, we have the program.cs and also one of the controllers, which is the weather forecast controller. Now, if you're new to .NET 6 and ASP.NET Core templates, it doesn't have startup.cs by default and all of those code goes into the program.cs file. To send messages to the Azure Service Bus queue, let's add a new post endpoint in this controller. Right now, we have only a get method. So let's add in a post method. Let's add HTTP post, which will be used to specify the post method and then specify public. Since this is, will be a asynchronous method, let's use task and name it as post. In this case, we can take in the weather forecast as the object that comes in, which is the data object that is used to handle weather forecast data. So let's specify data. Now we will be sending this data into an Azure Service Bus queue. For that, we first need to create a Service Bus queue. So let's head off into my Azure portal and search for Service Bus. Let's select Service Bus from the option and click Create. So in this case, we are creating a Service Bus namespace. A namespace is a container for all messaging components, which includes queues and topics. In this case, we are only interested about queues. So multiple queues and topics can be in a single namespace and namespaces often serve as application containers. So you can literally look this as a container for your application. In this particular case, this is for the weather data application. So if we come back to the Azure portal, let's click create service bus namespace. Let's create a new resource group for this and which I'll be deleting later. So let's name this delete too because I already have one for delete. Let's choose a name for this. So let's say this is going to be YouTube demo. Let's select the location that's closest to me. In this case, Australia East. Let's also select the pricing tier. Now, if you want more details on the options, you can click the view full pricing details, which shows you the different pricing tiers that's available. So based on your requirement, you can choose between basic, standard and premium. There's different capabilities in each of these pricing tiers. Now, if all that you want is a queue, you can stick with basic, but it also limits some of the functionalities of queues in this case. So let's select standard and click select. Let's review and create. Once the validation is succeeded, we can click create. This is going to create an Azure service bus inside our subscription. Let's wait for this deployment is completed. The service bus deployment is complete. So let's click go to resource and go to the newly created YouTube demo service bus namespace. Under here on the left, we can go to queues where we can create a new queue inside this service bus namespace. Let's click the plus queue button and create a new queue. In this case, let's name this as add weather data since this is going to be adding weather data. By default, it gives a size of 1 GB for the max queue size, the delivery count of 10 and the time to live as 14 days. We also have a few other options here, which we will see in a following video where I'll be covering the advanced concepts in Azure Service Bus queues. For now, let's leave it with all the default options and click create. The queue is successfully created and we can see that inside the list here. Now let's start using this queue from the .NET application and send messages and see how we can see them inside here. 
To connect to this queue from a .NET code, we would either need to use a connection string or we can use managed identity, which I'll show you later in this video. So for now, I'll go under the shared access policies and get the connection string to connect to this particular queue. So let's click the root managed shared access key, which can be used for managing send and listen capabilities. So let's copy the primary connection string from here and use this from the application when required. Let's come back to Visual Studio. To connect to the service bus queue, we need to use a NuGet package. So let's right click on the project and say manage NuGet packages. We can search for service bus and this will give us the required NuGet package. So let's say service bus. And what we need is the azure.messaging.servicebus NuGet package. Let's click install, which installs the NuGet package into our project. The NuGet package is successfully installed. So let's come back to our weather forecast controller. So let's create a new client from the new service bus client. So let's use service bus client. And we need to include the appropriate usings. This time, this is from the azure.messaging.servicebus. That is the NuGet package that we just added. This service bus client by default takes in a connection string. We already have the connection string copied. So let's specify where connection string is equal to and paste in the connection string that I just copied earlier. Let's collapse this and pass in the connection string to our client. For now, we will be leaving the connection string inside the code, which we will later remove once we have managed identities. If you're using connection strings to connect to your service bus queues, make sure to store this in a sensitive place. So definitely don't leave this inside the source code and check it into your source control. I have another video on how you can manage sensitive info when building .NET applications on Azure. I will link that here for your reference. To use this client to send a message, we need a sender. So let's use a var sender and specify client.create sender. This takes in a sender that is used to send a message to a specific queue or a topic name. Now in our case, we had named it as add weather data. So let's give the appropriate queue name here. Once we have the sender, we can use it to send messages. The sender has two methods that you can use to send messages. So if you type in send, you can see send message and send messages async. That's when you want to send multiple messages. Let's use the send message async and pass in a service bus message. So since we don't have one, let's create one right before this. So let's name this as message and specify where message is equal to new service bus message. Now this has different overloaded constructors. So we can use the one that takes in a string, which is the string body. So let's convert this weather forecast data into a JSON serialized string that we can then use inside this service bus message. So let's specify where body is equal to and use the JSON serializer that comes from the system.text.json. So let's make sure to include the appropriate usings here and then call the serialize method. In this case, we can pass in the data that needs to be serialized. We can then use this body to be passed to the service bus constructor. So let's pass the body here and we have a service bus message created. This is the bare minimum that you need to set up to send a message. Now we can await on this since this is an asynchronous call. So let's add await and make sure to also add an async for the task method. Let's put a breakpoint in this post method and run this application. The application is running successfully and it opens the Swagger UI, which is automatically configured in the ASP.NET API template. We have the post method that we added to send the message to the queue. So let's click that and say try it out and select execute. This by default sends a dummy message, which is the weather forecast data. So let's click execute and this hits our breakpoint. So let's step through this, which creates the connection string, then the client from the connection string. It then creates a sender with the queue details that we gave in. Once that is there, this converts this data object, which is the weather forecast data that we passed from the UI just now, which has all these dummy information and serializes that as a string inside the body parameter. Once we have the message, we can send this to the Azure Service Bus queue. So if we come back to the UI, we can see this is posted successfully. So let's navigate back to our Service Bus queue to see this message. Let's come under the queues section and select the add weather data. 
Here, we can see the summary of the queue. In this case, this does show there is one active message. It also shows the various properties that's associated with this service bus queue that we created. To explore these messages, we can use the service bus explorer, which is in preview from the left. Here, we have different options to send, receive, and peek messages from this queue. In this case, since we want to see the message that we just sent, in a non-destructive way, we will use peak. When we use peak, the message is still available on the queue for other people to consume. This is just showing what is there in the queue. Whereas if we use receive, the message will be removed from the queue and then it will no longer be available if it's processed successfully. There are cases where the messages can come back even when we use a receive. I'll show you in a moment later. So let's use peak, select queue and select peak again here. This reads to the weather data queue and shows us the message inside this list down below. So here we can see that there is the message that we just sent from our application. So here it has the temperature 32 and also the summary which says string. This is the default weather data that we just posted. This also has a few other properties. So you can see there is a sequence number, a message ID and also the enqueued time. There's also a delivery count and a subject. Sequencing and timestamping are two features that's enabled on the service bus queue. Now, if the absolute order of messages is significant for your application, then you can use the sequence number. Now, this is a gap-free, increasing number, so which will be always sequential. It's also a unique 64-bit integer number. You can also use the message identifier if you want a unique GUID that is used to be identified. But that is not a sequential number. Now this sequence number can be trusted as a unique identifier because the Azure service bus takes care of making sure it's unique and sequential. You can also use this to determine the order of arrival of messages. Now in this case, since this was the first message, the sequence number is 1. Now if you drop another message, that's going to have 2. Now if you have multiple different applications sending messages into this queue, it will be numbered according to the order in which the service bus queue received it. We will see a few of these properties, the enqueued time, a delivery count, a while later once we start processing the message. To process this message, we can either use background jobs, web jobs, Azure functions, etc. In this case, let's create a new Azure function that can be used to process these messages coming into this service bus queue. So let's go back to our Visual Studio, stop this application, right click on the Solution Explorer and add a new project. So let's select add new project. Now let's choose an Azure function. I have it already in my recent templates and click next. Let's name this as weather data processor and click create. Since I will be using a service bus queue trigger, we can choose the service bus queue trigger from this option. Now this will have the default code to set up a trigger whenever a message is arriving on a service bus queue. Now for the local machine, I will be using the storage emulator as the storage account for this Azure function. The connection string name, let's name this as weather data connection. The queue name in our case is add weather data, which is where we are sending the messages. And let's click create. Here, if you open the solution explorer, we can see the weather data process Azure function is created. We have the function 1.cs, which is the file where we have the function code. There's also the local settings.json where we can add the connection string for this particular service bus queue. Now, if we navigate back to the function 1.cs, we can see a run method, which will be invoked when this Azure function is invoked. Now, this uses a service bus trigger, which means anytime a message comes into this service bus, this function will be triggered. Now, this is listening on the add weather data, and the connection name is the weather data connection. So let's copy this and make sure to add in a value inside the local settings.json. So under values, we can send another value, which is the weather data connection and specify the connection string here. So we already have the connection string copied on our clipboard manager. So let's use windows and V to open the clipboard manager and use the connection string from there. So let's click this, which paste that into here. Now when the Azure function runs, it will use the service bus trigger, connect to this particular service bus queue from this connection name, and then use the add weather data to listen to messages.
By default, this is simply getting the queue item and logging that into the console. So let's run this to see if this is working as expected. So let's right click on the project, set startup projects and select multiple startup projects. Let's make sure to run both the apps when we press F5. So let's click start on both these app and click apply and OK. We need to make sure that this run is a static method since this is inside a static class. In a different video, I show you how to use an instance class and use dependency injection inside Azure Functions. Check that out if you are new to building Azure Functions. Let's press F5 to run both the applications. Let's make sure to add in a breakpoint in our function code so that this hits whenever a message is dropped in the queue. Now since we already have a message in our queue, this will be hitting as soon as the function starts up. So we have both the web API and also the Azure functions running. Now the Azure function is running using the Azure function core tools which I had installed previously. If you're new to Azure Functions, I highly recommend checking out my Getting Started with Azure Functions video where I walk through the end-to-end -end on building Azure Functions. The function code is running and the breakpoint is also hit. So if you look at the My Q item, we can see this has the temperature 32 and also the text that we dropped when we send it from the UI. Let's continue this execution and this is going to log this message inside the console. Now if we send another message, so let's go to the Swagger UI, select try it out and specify testing inside the summary, we can see that message coming here. So let's click execute, which is again going to hit our breakpoint. So let's continue the execution, which will make sure that the message is dropped into the queue and this gets picked up by our Azure Functions code. Let's continue the execution here and we will see this is logged inside our function console. So you can see the summary test that's just dropped inside the queue. Now when we dropped the message, it got picked up immediately. This is because the queue makes it available as soon as the message is received. However, if we want a slight delay to be there when we drop messages into the queue, we can use a property when creating the message. So let's say if the message body contains the text scheduled, then we will set up some delay on the message that's coming up. So let's say scheduled. In this case, let's set the message dot schedule and queue time, which is the property that we need to set. Now this takes in a daytime offset. So let's use daytime offset. It needs to be in UTC time. So let's use UTC now and add a few seconds delay. So let's use add seconds and specify 15 in this particular case. So this message will be available on the queue only after 15 seconds. And this is only happening when the body is containing scheduled. Let's run this and see this in action. Let's remove this breakpoint since we don't require this anymore. Both the Azure function and the web API is running successfully. So let's go into the weather forecast, select try it out and specify a scheduled message. So let's say scheduled test and click execute. Now since the word scheduled is there, this message is going to be dropped with a scheduled and queued time. So if you see the Azure function did not pick it up immediately. Once the specified time is complete, the message will be available on the queue and the Azure function will be triggered. Now you can see this is coming here and if we continue the execution, it will log it to the console. Now scheduled messages can be used if you want to delay doing some actions or schedule things for the future. Like let's say you want to schedule sending an email or sending a notification etc. You can use the scheduled property when you enqueue the message. Let's come back to the weather forecast controller. There's another property which says time to live. Now there was a default value for this which was 14 days. Now what this means is if the message is in the queue for 14 days and is not getting processed, then the message will automatically be removed. Now let's try and see this in action. So let's reduce this time because I don't want to wait 14 days to show you this feature. So let's specify if body.contains and if this contains the text TTL, which means time to live, let's specify the message time to live property. So let's select message dot time to live and set this as seconds. Now time to live is a property that is in time span. So let's use time span dot from seconds and specify 20 seconds. Now after 20 seconds, if no application is picking this up, then this message will be automatically removed. 
Now in this case, to demo this, since we don't want the Azure function to be running, let's just right click the service bus queue and say debug and start new instance. This will run just the web API application. So the messages that we drop inside the queue will not be picked up by the Azure function. The web API is successfully running. Let's also make sure to open the Azure portal so that we can see this message inside the portal. So let's come to the web API, select the post and say try it out. Here, for the time to live to be set, let's specify TTL and say test and click execute. The message is successfully dropped and it will be available only for 20 seconds. So let's use peak and we can see the message here, which has the TTL test and it also has the time to live property as 20 seconds. Now after 20 seconds, if we refresh this and peak again, that message is automatically removed. Now this message was not processed by any applications, but it was automatically removed after the time to live expired. Now this is particularly useful if you want to add in certain messages that can expire after a certain time. So this could again be notifications, which is only valid for certain period of time or other business use cases that you might have in your applications. Now that we have seen these two properties, let's see about the delivery count. Now every time the message was getting processed, the message was getting removed from this particular queue. Now let's say in some case we have an exception in processing this message. So let's come back to our application, go to our function1.cs and add in some code here. So let's say if the my queue item, which is the string message, contains the word exception, then in this case we will simply throw an exception. So let's add in the word exception. In this case, let's say we are throwing a new exception here. Now in your real application, this could be some scenario where the data is invalid and your function cannot process it successfully. I'm just simulating it when I have the text exception in the message. Let's run this to see this in action. Both the web API and the function is running. So let's click post and say try it out. In this case, let's specify the message which has the exception word in it and say test and click execute. Now this is going to drop into the queue and it's going to get picked up by our Azure function. The Azure function has successfully picked it up, but in this case, this is going to contain an exception word and it is going to throw an exception. Once this function code returns that it has an exception, it releases this message back into the queue so that it can be reprocessed. So you can see the breakpoint is hit again because this message appeared back into the queue. Now, if you go back to the service bus queue in here and select peak, you can see that the delivery count is now made to two. This is because the message is delivered the second time. Now, since this message again contains the exception, this is going to go in a loop. So if I continue the execution and press F5, it's going to again throw the exception. And the moment I'm going to release it, this message is going to appear again. Now, if I navigate back into the queue and select peak, now this delivery count has now become three because this is the third time that this message is delivered. Now, when we created the queue, we had specified the maximum delivery count. Now, if we come back to the overview, we can see here the max delivery count is 10, which means only after 10 tries will this message be given up. Let's remove the breakpoint and continue the execution. Now you can see inside the Azure function, this gets logged continuously. Let's make sure that this does not break on this exception and press F5 again. So if we come back to our Azure functions, you can see this message will be delivered 10 times. Once that is done, this message will be automatically removed into the dead letter queue. Now if we come back to the service bus explorer and look at the messages and select peak again, we will see that there is no message inside here. Now this is because the message was delivered 10 times but the application couldn't process it. So it decided to move it into the dead letter queue. Now, if you navigate into the dead letter queue and select peak, you can see this message in here. You can also see that the delivery count is now 11. So if you select this, you can see this message and you can know that this has an exception case. Now in your applications, you can have alerts or monitor these dead letter queues and reprocess the message from here. Now, if we come back to the overview, and update this maximum delivery count, then the message will be delivered only those many times. So let's click change and specify two in this case. 
which means the message will be re-delivered only two times. Now once the service bus queue is update is complete, we can rerun the message. So let's come back and make a breakpoint in here and redrop the message again. So let's this time say exception test new and click execute. The message has come here once. Now since this is an exception, this is coming back one more time after which this message won't appear because we have updated the max delivery count to be two. Now if we go back to the service bus explorer and peek on the dead letter queue, there will be two messages. So let's select peak, the dead letter queue and select peak. Here we have two messages and this time the delivery count is only three because the max delivery count was two. Now that we have successfully created the queue, send messages and read and processed messages from it, let's see how we can clean up this code a bit. So if we come into the weather forecast controller, we are creating the client instances and everything inside this particular class. Let's see how we can dependency inject this. In this case, what we will need is the service bus client instance, which is coming into a constructor here. So let's refactor this code, make sure to add the service bus client, so let's say service bus client, specify it as client and set this as a read-only property inside this class. So let's create and assign a field which creates the read-only property. Now instead of creating a new client here, we can automatically use this client that's injected in. So let's for now remove this code and set this up in the dependency injection. Now let's leave the rest of the code as same and set up the dependency injection. So if we navigate to program.cs, which is where we have to set up dependency injection for this application. If you're new to dependency injection, check out the video linked here to understand more. Now to set up dependency injection, we need to add a NuGet package. So if we right click the project and select manage NuGet packages, let's search for microsoft.extensions.azure, which is the NuGet package that we want. Let's select that and click install. Once this is installed successfully, let's come back to program.cs and use builder.services and specify add Azure clients as the method. Let's make sure to add the appropriate usings. In this case, this is coming from the microsoft.extensions.azure NuGet package that we just added. So let's select that and specify the builder that is required by this particular function. Now using this builder, we can register the service bus client. So this has an extension method which says add service bus client. All this needs is the connection string to the service bus client. So let's paste the connection string code from the earlier one that we removed. We don't have to create a new client instance explicitly and simply use the connection string directly here. Now we have the connection string hard coded in here, which is also not a good practice. I will remove this once we add managed identity support. Now that we are adding the Azure service bus client into this builder.services, which will be used to dependency resolve when we create the weather forecast controller. So let's see this in action and make sure everything is working as before. So let's click F5. So the application hits the program.cs adds this service client inside the builder.service collection and which is used by the weather forecast controller. Both apps are running successfully. So let's click weather forecast, try it out and simply send a default message. Now this hits the breakpoint. We have the client instance injected in. So if we look at the client, we can see that this is successfully injected a service bus client. Now this was dependency injected through the constructor because we just registered it in the builder.service collection. So let's press F5 and this works as expected. So it comes to the service bus queue and this is picked up by our Azure function. Let's continue the execution so that it's processed successfully. The last thing for us to do is to remove this connection string completely from this application. Now having sensitive information like this in your source code is not at all a good practice. To do this, we will be using managed identities. If you're new to managed identities, check out my video linked here to learn more about it. Now with managed identities, we don't have to use connection strings to connect to any of the Azure resources. We can set up identities, which will be automatically set up by the Azure infrastructure. When you're running on your local development environment, it will use the user logged into Visual Studio to connect or different authentication mechanisms. 
I have a blog post detailing that out, which will be linked in the description below. When using managed identities, the add service bus client extension method cannot be used. So let's remove that and manually create in a builder client. So let's specify builder dot add client method and then specify that this will be a service bus client explicitly. So we can create the service bus client ourselves. So let's specify service bus client. Make sure to include the appropriate usings, which is the service bus one that we initially added. Let's also specify that this is the service bus client options that this particular function expects. So let's specify these two and provide the delegate method that this is expecting. So it expects one where the function takes in the options and the service bus client and returns back a client. Since we will not be using any of the ones that's passed in, let's ignore all of that using the underscore and specify the delegate function inside here. Now inside this, we can explicitly create the new service bus client like before. Now instead of using the connection string, let's use a different overload for this constructor. Now we will use this one where it takes the fully qualified namespace as the first parameter and a token credential. Now for the token credential, we will be using default Azure credential. Now this is the class that comes from the Azure.identity namespace, which we can include in this particular application. So let's create a new default Azure credential, which will be used to automatically resolve the identity that this application is running in. Now, based on where this application is running, it will use different mechanisms to get the credential. Now, if you're running on your local machine, it can use your Visual Studio login, the Azure CLI information, etc. Once you have deployed this into the Azure infrastructure, you can set up managed identities there as well. I show you how to do this on a web API and also on the Azure function in a separate video, which will be linked here. Now to specify the namespace, we can copy it from here, which is YouTube demo.servicebus.windows.net. So let's paste that in here and completely remove the connection string from our application code. Let's make sure to add the semicolon and this successfully creates a new service bus client instance and injects it into the service collection. The only thing is there is no connection string now here and no sensitive information. The only thing is specific to your environment would be this URL. You can easily move this into a configuration file and use it from there. If you're new to .NET configuration, check out another video linked here on that. Now with all that set up, we need to make sure that we add my local user into this service bus so that it has access to send and receive messages. To do that, let's go to the Azure portal. Let's navigate back to the service bus queue. So let's go to overview and select the namespace that we have, which is YouTube demo. Inside this, we can go to the access control IAM to add role assignments. Now let's click add here and select role assignment. Now, since I'm going to specify for service bus, let's search for service bus. And this gives different default roles, which is the data owner, receiver and sender. You can see the description for each of these. Now this provides full access for the service bus resources or receive and send only accesses. Now, depending on your application needs or what the application does, you can pick and choose the different roles that you need to give. Now, in this case, let's select the data owner so that I have full access to the Azure service bus resources and click next. Let's select the members and select my local user. So I'll select both of these accounts because this is the user accounts that I have used to log in to my Visual Studio. Let's click select. Once that is done, let's say review and assign. Now, if you're using a managed identity, you will be selecting managed identity to select the members. Then you can use an Azure function or a deployed Azure web app. Let's click review and assign, which will add these role assignments into this particular service bus that we have created. If you navigate under role assignments, you can see the permissions that we have just added. We see that the Azure service bus data owner and also the users that this is associated to. Let's come back to Visual Studio. Under Tools, in Options, I have the Azure Service Authentication, which is set to the correct default directory as well. Let's click OK and run this application to see this in action. Both our applications are running, so let's click Post, say Try it out, and click Execute. Now this has hit the breakpoint, 
let's say f5, the first time it runs, it takes a few seconds to resolve the token using the default Azure credential. You can see that the message was successfully dropped and our Azure function is hit as well. So if you continue this execution, this gets logged in the Azure functions. Now, if we go to the console host, which is hosting the web API, you can see the logs on how this token is received. Now you can see here in this particular case, the environmental credential authentication is unavailable and the managed identity credential is also unavailable. In this particular case, it is using the token using my Visual Studio credentials, which you can see here, which says Visual Studio credential get token invoked, which is what is getting the scopes that is required for this execution. Now, if this application was running in an Azure web app, it would have got from the managed identity enabled on the web app. But you will have to make sure you add the appropriate role assignments for this service bus. Now we have completely removed the need for the connection string. If we navigate to our Azure functions, we can do the same there as well. To use managed identity with Azure functions, we need to make sure that it uses a NuGet package, which is of version 5.x or higher. When we specify the configuration value, we also need to make sure we append it with underscore underscore fully qualified namespace. This tells the service bus trigger to use default Azure credential to connect to the service bus. So let's copy this, navigate back to our Visual Studio, go to Solution Explorer, right click on this project and say manage NuGet packages. Let's make sure that the NuGet package this uses for the service bus is on version 5.x. Since this is on 4.3, I will need to update this. So let's go under updates, select this and select to update to 5.2.0. Once this is updated, we can set up this to use managed identities. The update is successful. So let's go into the local settings.json and in the weather data connection, let's append the underscore underscore fully qualified namespace. This means this connection string has only the fully qualified namespace. So we can remove the rest from this particular connection string. Now here we have the namespace, which is YouTube demo dot service bus dot windows dot net. This is exactly the same that we used in program dot CS when we set up the service bus client explicitly. Now this particular suffix tells the service bus trigger to use the similar mechanism to connect to service bus. Now, once this is all set up, let's run this to see this in action. Both applications are running successfully. So let's click try it out and select execute. This uses managed identity to connect and drop the message into the queue. And the Azure function is also triggered, which means this is now successfully connecting using the weather data connection, but with default Azure credential. Now, if we press F5, this will also continue execution and it will log here. Earlier in this channel, I had talked about Azure storage queues. Now, if you want to know the differences between the storage queues and the service bus queues, check out this link, which will be there in the description below. You can see under what circumstances you can use which of these technologies. Now consider using storage queues if your application must store more than 80 gigabytes of messages in the queue, or if all you need is a simple queuing mechanism. Now with the service bus queues, you get a lot more functionality, which is not available when you are using storage queues. Some of the things that we saw were the sequential GUIDs, the guaranteed ordering of messages, and certain advanced properties that we will see in a future video. But I highly recommend checking this out if you are confused between selecting which of the queues for your application. I hope this helps you to get started with Azure Service Bus queues, create them and use it from a .NET application. I will be doing a follow-up video on the additional properties that we had skipped over and show the advanced capabilities when using service bus queues. If you want to be notified when that video comes out, make sure to hit the subscribe button. This also helps me to grow this YouTube channel. And if you like this video, please make sure to hit the like button. Also, don't forget to pop in the comments if you have any questions, feedback or suggestions for future videos. Thank you and see you soon.